moving on now, I think I'll turn it over to Paul and uh, Paul Locke, our uh, Deputy Commissioner for Operations, uh, to talk about the 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 ongoing discussions that we're having and the work that's being done on soil beneficial reuse and um, looking at soil disposal capacity. And, and Paul, would you like me to just stop sharing so you, you can see the crowd or? Uh, well, if you stop sharing and then I could share some slides that I have. Okay. All right. If I'm allowed, ah, I see the host is disabled participant screen sharing. See, see, this see, is now what I... happens when you move out of waste like cleanup <laughs> and move on. Now I have the power. Here we Take go. Take all your powers away. <laughs> you should be able to share now, I think. Ah, there we go. Okay, let's go to screen two. Okay, so you should be seeing... Uh, my slides, uh, soil reuse and disposal um, stuff. Uh, so this is an ongoing conversation that we've been having uh, for a while now, uh, just to kind of reinforce, you know, uh, I've been participating, um, representing the commissioner's office. Uh, Liz is the assistant commissioner for wayside cleanup. Uh, Ken Mara has um, uh, also kind of taken up this as well. And I think David Foss will be, uh, involved as and a number of other DEP staff, uh, including the regional uh, deputy regional directors and some of the regional staff have are certainly interested in this and have been participating both in the internal discussions and the external discussions that we'll talk about in a second. Uh, also, I, I think it's important to point out that uh, Greg Cooper from the Bureau of Air and Waste has been participating and having having them intimately involved in this and coming coming along with this discussions, I think is key to making uh, making some of the changes, or uh, at least considering some of the changes that we're going to be talking about. So it is a kind of full on effort from the department. And while I'm representing the commissioner's office, uh, our, uh, Commissioner Suberg is very interested in kind of making sure that this moves along. Um, and that we we find some uh, some solution to the the capacity issues. So let's see if we can make this move. Okay, so we've had uh, a bunch of ongoing discussions uh, starting last December with the listening session, uh, and then you know both in the advisory committee meetings, uh, in LSPA meetings, environmental business council meetings. Uh, this has been a hot topic. Uh, and you're know, rightly so. Um, the, uh, the the lack of capacity, the the shutting down of landfills in Massachusetts makes this uh, the this an issue not only for soil and the uh, material coming out of our development projects and what you do with it based upon what the concentrations are, but that soil is competing for capacity and for use uh, with other materials. Uh, uh, including MSW, uh, including um, biosolids and residuals as well. So th this question of where do you put this material that we continue to generate and that we really can't stop generating uh, uh, is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Uh, there is a, a group formed, the Massachusetts Soil Beneficial Reuse Coalition, uh, and you know, I, I would have thought a, a better acronym would, would have been good, but Ms. Brooke, um, uh has been very helpful. We, we have met with this group and some of the members I, I've lifted on, on the bottom, but I, I'm led to understand that there are a lot more people in the background that have been participating in this, uh, in their meetings and trying to come up with some specific proposals. Um, and and that has been very helpful. Uh, it's good to um, you know have people on the outside not only pushing it but uh, coming up uh, with ideas for you know specific changes that can be made rather than what we sometimes hear not in the wayside cleanup program uh, but elsewhere of oh this is a problem DEP do something about it this is more we we all recognize this is a problem and here are some ideas that we want to start talking about uh, and that we think can work. So 
it is going to be an ongoing discussion. I, and I think right now it's um, a moment to, to start moving it to the next level as we'll, we'll start talking about. So the materials that we're talking about, you know, anything coming out of you know, 21 East sites and Brownfield's uh, redevelopment sites and general uh, development projects in general, are, can span the range from you know, nice, clean, natural background on one extreme, uh, material that's less than RCS1, uh, would be unrestricted use, uh, less than RCS2, you know, uh, moving up the chain, uh, material that you know, could go into COM15 projects except for some little quirks like pH or uh, conductivity. Uh, historic fill, and I put that in the middle because it can span the concentrations and what you find in historic fill can span a, a wide range. Uh, certainly remediation waste, which you could break down to uh, kind of different uh, characteristics uh, compared to the COM97 numbers and certainly greater than COM97. And then hazardous waste, which again, the concentrations may vary, but if you're in the hazardous waste category, um, that comes with its own requirements. So I think right now the, the discussions are mostly focused on those materials that can't get into COM15 because of these other facilities, because of these other criteria. Um, historic fill, of course, wide range of concentrations. And the material that would otherwise go for grading and shaping uh, at COM90 and daily cover for at COM97. Uh, facilities, but because of the uh, closing of landfills, that capacity is drying up. Um, I think we'll take off the table for now anything considered hazardous waste, anything that has really high concentrations that wouldn't even go to a COM 97. And and I think, and I'd say correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, don't correct me. Uh, the materials that can go to COM 15 facilities, uh, I think right uh, right now we probably have uh, capacity for that, and we have other facilities that are potentially coming online in the near future. So I hope that we have the, the bottom end solved. I think the top end of this, uh, the hazardous waste type of material and really contaminated soil is always going to have to go for disposal or treatment. And it's that middle material where uh, we have been able to reuse it in the past, but those are drying up. The question is, can we find other ways of beneficially using these materials so that they don't go for disposal? Uh, and hopefully that it, it happens within the state um, because sending things out of state is always a solution, but it's a costly, time-consuming, unreliable solution. And we recognize that. So uh, the Ms. Bricka, uh, came came to us uh, most recently with uh, some specific proposals for things that uh, actions that can be taken. And this is a gross simplification. I, I think we probably should um, you know post the proposal uh, the, you know, the details uh, on the website. So uh, as we brought in the discussion for this, uh, people have uh, a better idea of you know all of the details and specifics. But they can be broken down into these broad categories of uh, revisiting closed landfills, um, that there's potential for some of accepting more material in order to grade and shape the closed landfill for new post-closure uses. Uh, and, and, and what would, you know, could there be a mechanism for uh, bringing in more material uh, making those landfills appropriate for some beneficial reuse uh, in the future uh, without having to re-engineer everything as if you were accepting uh, more uh, solid waste material, recognizing that soil is different, even somewhat contaminated soil is different from uh, solid waste. Uh, there was proposals for uh, looking at some of the uh, materials that get rejected from the COM15 facilities, uh, and, and particularly based on criteria like pH. Uh, there's a specific pH range, uh, and could that be broadened to be able to accept more uh, material uh, conductivity? Uh, there's requirements uh, for some materials to be non-detect, uh, and that being less than 
10% of the RCS1? Are there other ways of defining what essentially would be de minimis or minimal uh, levels of, of, of those materials? And these are particularly like volatile compounds, uh, materials that we might have some concerns about leaching to groundwater, um, where we have a very strict requirement of being less than 10% of the RCS1. Is there, now that we have experience uh, of looking at and have been running these facilities, are, is is it possible to adjust that level uh, to allow something? And uh, I think it was proposed to uh, be able to accept RCS2 remediation wastes uh, at RCS2 facilities. And I think that we we did deal with that early in the year and um, and we'll just, you know, as facilities come, as RCS2 facilities come to us and request it, we, we can modify and uh, are amenable to modifying uh, the ACO and the so management criteria to specifically allow our, less than RCS2 material that comes from an RCS1 site and thus gets flagged as remediation waste, uh, even though the concentrations are well within the uh, acceptance criteria for the facility. Um, so we've been doing that. And so I think we, we can cross that one off the list. Uh, another proposal was looking at uh, aggregate material, crushed C and D material. Uh, that has some uh, measurable levels of uh, contamination under the BUD, the beneficial use determination rules, uh, that material would not be appropriate, uh, would not be allowed for uh, reuse uh, because of the uh, fairly very stringent concentrations. So the question comes up, are the situations where uh, this aggregate material can be reused safely and appropriately with appropriate oversight? Uh, including being used at 21E sites where there's oversight by an LSP or places where it's clearly um, minimal exposure potential, minimal risk, such as under highways, right, highway rights of way. Uh, another intriguing uh, proposal was, was proposed as COM23, um, uh, which is, is the department uh, amenable to considering uh, reusing remediation waste across 21E sites. Uh, as you all know, uh, if you're working within a site, um, the you know, keeping the uh, contaminated soil on site, reusing it on site um, within the boundaries of the disposal site, as long as the end result is uh, consistent with a level of no significant risk, then you know, we don't make people dig up and, and remove all contaminated soil. It can be reused on site. The question would be, if you can do it at one site, what are the potential impossibilities uh, with appropriate controls for uh, reusing remediation waste across sites? Uh, the kind of one example that came up would be for uh, railroads or highway projects. Uh, where uh, one construction project along a rail, uh, rail line may require excavation um, cutting, uh, which will produce uh, uh, some remediation waste and removal of the soil, but another project uh, might require additional fill and using the material cut from one project to fill the other may be appropriate. And what would be the controls and requirements you know, if that were, were to be considered? Uh, and finally, uh, another intriguing one is uh, uh, looking at soil monofills. So rather than reusing uh, contaminated soil at uh, functioning MSW solid waste facilities to create soil monofills that would have separate and specific requirements for construction and operation um, that is specific to, to soil uh, and kind of allowing some flexibility on those criteria and those requirements that are in place because uh, MSW is a much more varied um, waste stream and requires uh, certain types of controls and restrictions that might not be applicable to soil. So is it possible either through policy and waivers from the commissioner's office or through regulation and developing a set of criteria, a set of requirements specific to these type of facilities uh, that we could um, create uh, 
solid waste facilities, uh, uh, soil monofill facilities that would, oh, I misspelled monofill, um, that, that would take these materials. So as you see, the, there's kind of a lot of crossover between uh, solid waste, whether it's for the monofills or for uh, the bud determinations uh, and the waste site cleanup program here. So it's good that we have both the commissioner's office involved and both bureaus that would be addressing this. Now that's a lot, in, and at one level, a lot of this makes sense. Uh, in moving forward, I, I would throw out there some uh, some concerns that we are have heard and are going to hear, and that uh, DEP is raising itself. And I think one of the great things about the effort uh, so far in the discussions we've had is that people recognize that these are concerns that have to be addressed, and that the ultimate success of any one or more of those specific proposals or variations thereof would be making sure that they address you know, a lot of things up front. Um, one being is local acceptance. Uh, I think COM15 is working because of their requirement to go to the community up front and talk with them, talk about the project, uh, what is and what is not going to happen, and to get that community acceptance uh, in place before we move on to the ACO. Um, and you know the community, rightly so, will be having. You know we can predict uh, what their concerns are going to be. You know what levels of contaminated material they are going to bring in. What are the potential impacts to groundwater and surface water and air? You know the dust that's going to be created, uh, the noise, the truck traffic, and how is it all going to fit into the community in the end? Uh, and you know, these are things we, we know going into it and we should be able to address uh, to people's satisfaction. We have with COM15 facilities, and I think with some of these others, we can do that as long as we, we know uh, and recognize that these are legitimate concerns. And you know, we have to have good answers going into it before uh, a facility will be accepted. Uh, we have to make sure that we have control of the materials. Uh, we we don't want to create situations we, where we are creating new exposures, where we're creating new environmental problems. Uh, we have to, you know, and some of these repeated from the the local acceptance because DEP's comfort in accepting these proposals are also going to you know, depend upon, you know, what are the exposures, you know, making sure that we're not going to have an impact to surface water or groundwater, or we're not going to create dust problems. Uh, all of that has to be addressed up front. We have to make sure we have we we are comfortable with those controls that are going to be in place. Uh, if we're talking about moving and finding new homes for contaminated material, regardless of kind of what the the range of concentrations are, uh, we're going to have to make sure that there are um, uh, requirements in place to make sure that you know it is going to be maintained over the long term. Uh, and whether that involves activity and use limitations or FAMs or some other controls, uh, we don't want to have uh, situations where we, we have created a new problem somewhere else. And uh, 20 years from now, uh, the people that are going to succeed, all of us, are, are now dealing with the problems that we've left. So those have to be in place. And in general, I think we have to look at it and these projects have to, the benefits of these projects really should outweigh the costs of the projects and and not narrowly uh, to the site owner or the, the folks that are generating soil at the development projects. It has to work for the community as well. And we have a lot of examples where uh, the reuse of contaminated soil have resulted in fantastic public projects. Uh, that have benefited the entire community. There's a potential here to address climate resiliency, um, uh, to uh, minimize our greenhouse gas uh, production. Uh, we don't want to ship these things out of state uh, at great cost and great impact on the environment. Uh, so th these finished projects have to be uh, designed and developed and uh, and sold essentially in a way that it's clear that it's going to benefit everybody. Um, and I, I think kind of with those all in place, I, I think you know, there's great potential for moving ahead with these. So next slide. What we want to avoid are situations where we end up with huge piles of soil, lots of truck traffic, lots of dust, groundwater impacts. And then at some point, the, the owners, operators uh, declare bankruptcy and disappear. And we're left with this problem in the future. Um, 
but I think we can do that. Um, but we need to recognize that we we have had problems, you know, isolated problems, uh, you know, going back, you know, 30, 40, 50 years with land, you know, certain landfills or uh, projects. And we have learned the uh, from that, I think the projects that we're permitting and we're uh, approving these days have been working out really well. And I think we can continue uh, kind of in that direction. So uh, I want to open it up for discussion, um, but a couple of things I want to point out. One is that today here and uh, in the near future, I think maybe later this afternoon, um, you know, we are drawing in the advisory committees more formally. Uh, we've had some discussions, uh, you know, with with groups over the past year, as we've we've talked about. But I think it's important for the advisory committees to to play a role, and that we bring this to a wider audience now to begin talking about the specifics of kind of what some of these proposals would look like and what controls would need to be in place in order to affect them. Uh, the Wayside Cleanup Advisory Committee, I'm very happy to hear that the Solid Waste Advisory Committee uh, will be addressing this as well. Uh, uh, Ingrid Cooper is leading that. I, it was brought up in our uh, last meeting with the outside group that uh, there is this commissioner's level uh, advisory committee uh, called the Fees Advisory Committee. Uh, some of you may um, have participated in that or do participate in that. Um, and it's not limited to, to fees. Uh, they talk about pretty much everything. But at, at each level, um, we, we want to get the soil capacity issues on the agenda for all of these advisory committees and have that maintain uh, kind of the, the momentum for having it discussed, not only within the programs, but at the commissioner's level as well. So, um, so we would have that happen. Uh, this the transition to the new administration. Uh, I, you know, obviously, we have a um, election coming up. Uh, there will be a new governor. Uh, there likely will be a new commissioner because that generally always happens when there's a transition. Uh, so we do want to make sure that we, we maintain this mo momentum. And I think that's one reason why we want to uh, kind of go to the advisory committees and make sure that it's on those visible agendas and carry forth into the new administration uh, kind of you know, across the board. And then uh, I was at this point when I called Liz and interrupted um, the meeting, <laughs> the pre-meeting this morning, and I only typed DEP, but I wanted to um, put here that, uh, make, make a point that DEP staff are, particularly the wayside cleanup staff, are very committed to making sure that we continue these conversations and continue these changes as, as we move ahead uh, and look at what the options are. Because the, the wayside cleanup program uh, certainly needs to responsibly address uh, soil that's being generated and excavated from our 21E sites. It's an integral part of our cleanup process. Uh, and part of our obligation is to make sure that that soil uh, uh, is either disposed of or reused in the best safe manner possible. Uh, so, you know, we have an obligation and I think we are, we are making a, a commitment to continue to do that. With that, Deborah Darby has her hand raised. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Paul and Liz, thank you for this meeting. Um, the first question is, I'm, as you probably know, I'm very much interested in this. Um, the MBTA has successfully, and um, it's still ongoing, um, had a project where soil reuse was, was front and center and part of the design process, the South Coast Rail, and we were very successful at um, reusing a lot of the soils that were generated in this project. And the last that I, um, and I don't have the statistics and I was looking to see if Mike was on this call, but I couldn't tell, is that we have successfully recycled over 75% of the soils that we generated, which is, is a good thing. However, you know, one of the problems that we have is that the way you de determine or define our right of ways and that only includes the active track where the trains actually run along the tracks. It doesn't include the infrastructure that supports the operations of a transit system. And had 
the definition of a right of way been expanded to include those areas, we would have had a higher reuse capacity for our soils because we could have put them underneath stations, um, um, foundations, we could have put them um, underneath or underpinned the parking lots. Those areas are excluded from the definitions of right of way. So I guess I'm here to ask if the department would consider that. The other um, um, thing, and, I, and, and I'm gonna try to be quick, um, is that the T is looking at cross using soils from one project, if it's a cut project to use it on a project that's primarily a fill project. Our problem at this point is trying to align the projects so that that can happen smoothly. But my question to you, in the event that we can't, um, because we, we may not always be able to do that, will there be regulations in place that would allow short-term stockpiling of soils until a, the, the fill project came online um, and then we could transfer the soils from that? Um, and then the other, observation that I noticed is that when you were talking about um, the MSBRC was talking about in their solutions allow aggregate materials to be reused at 21 east sites and highway rights of way I was wondering why did they exclude railroads in that use as well that I don't I don't want the T to you know not have that opportunity as well yeah so I, I, I'll maybe take some of these, but Liz, you can shut me up and um, drain in if you like. Uh, the prerogatives of a deputy commissioner, I guess. Um, first, I, I wouldn't read anything into uh, the Soils Coalition. The chat says Soils Coalition is a good way of referring to the group. I wouldn't read anything into the talking about the highway right of ways and not including uh, the railroad rights of way. I, I think the the more general point is that there are you know places where this material can be successfully reused and and potential exposures of the long term controlled in certain ways. Uh, so I think highway rights way is an example of that. I I don't think that they intended to uh, specifically you know, limit it to highways and exclude the railroads. I think it was just a shorthand to uh, things like highway rights of way where exposure is fairly obviously and effectively controlled. Um, I, I think one of the reasons why I try to like not get into the details is that there, there are a lot of details that still need to be discussed and, um, and developed. I like the, you know, the comment of, well, maybe it should include railroad rights of way as well. And and we're at the point in this process where you know it's still on the table to be discussed. And and I guess I should note at this point that DEP and particularly me kind of bringing it up and mentioning it and talking about it isn't necessarily an endorsement of it, uh, but it's recognition that these are you know serious proposals that really need to be discussed and fleshed out. And you know the details that come out at the end of it uh, you yeah, know, we'll see what happens. Um, so, you know, you take your point and, you know, railroad rights of ways, you know, certainly I think would fall into that category. Uh, the, I think the definition of right of way, that point, I think one of the, um, the items on the list was, uh, are there like 21 east sites or other locations that can take remediation waste from other projects? And that wasn't limited to, to railroad rights of way. So I would more generalize your question of, you know, can we you know, expand the definition of rights of way? Well, that's one way of doing it. A another way of getting at the same point is, uh, is expanding the types of locations that can accept uh, remediation waste for beneficial use. Uh, so we wouldn't have to call a, a administration building or a, you know, a, um, something else you know, adjacent to a right-of-way. We wouldn't have to call it a right-of-way. We could say, you know, this is an appropriate location you know, as a 21 e site or, or something else to accept this material. So rather than kind of try to fit things into existing definitions, another way of doing it is just expand the list of locations where it would be appropriate to reuse this material. 
uh, and then the short-term storage thing, I think, um, you know, I think there's potential, uh, obviously in, in the MCP, there's a, a um, section and, you know, I used to rattle off these citations off the top of my head, but uh, that remediation has to go to a location that is uh, approved by federal, state, or local authorities. Um, so I think there's you know, certainly ways of uh, of looking at that, and and there's probably a mechanism for DEP to approve locations for short-term storage. And the, you know some of the questions that were were up on the screen about concerns about long-term facilities, uh, you would probably have the same concerns for short-term storage facilities that's seeing a lot of, of soil coming and going. So it's um, you know, it, it's something that would have to be carefully considered, but I think there's a potential for that. Ned, I think you're next. Uh, thank you. Um, the I simply wanted to, I, I don't have anything to add really. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, this issue has bubbled up to this level of prominence. And I simply wanted to emphasize um, from the real estate development, redevelopment, brownfields redevelopment perspective, the critical importance of finding solutions that work in light of all the criteria you identified as quickly as possible. Um, the disruption that happens at construction sites uh, when the facility that you had lined up months ago says, whoops, we're full, or whoops, we can only take half of what uh, we said we would, um, is uh, remarkable. Uh, expensive and bad for the environment. And as a resident of Massachusetts, more than uh, somebody who works with lots of developers, the idea of sending this stuff out to o Ohio via rail is just nuts. So I simply wanted to reiterate how important this is to the redevelopment community. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. I, I would point out for, for those of you who are now listening to it after the fact, because this is being recorded, I didn't get into a lot of the, the the details of why this is needed. Ned kind of very concisely explained, uh, described some of them, but I think it would be worth you know anybody's while who is not as familiar with the issues that swirl around soil management to go back and listen to the um, the listening session from December of, of twenty was that just last year twenty twenty one. Um, which is on MassDEP's YouTube site, to get a really good understanding of all of the uh, capacity-related issues uh, related to soil and other materials. Uh, Kate. Kate is one of the Soil Coalition members. Thank you, Kate. No problem. Um, Paul, I'm wondering if you can comment on whether DEP is prioritizing any of you know, the considerations, you know, whether it's based on ease of implementation or degree of impact, and um, whether you can provide any comments on what might be a likely time frame to shake loose some of these reuse proposals. You know, are we looking at weeks, months, hopefully not longer than that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding about weeks, of course. Yeah, oh, good. <laughs> um, well, here, here's here's the thing. Uh, it it is an awkward time period because uh, we are going to have a change in administration. So there are there are some of those proposals that are going to take longer, because, uh, for instance, a uh, making reg changes in order to uh, site and and permit uh, soil monofills uh, will go the has to go the reg change route, which we all know is not very quick. Uh, and right now, you know, new reg changes, your proposals won't, you know, even be considered until the next administration comes along. Um, so there's going to be there's going to be an awkward period of probably the, the next six months or so where this is, administration is uh trying to you know button up some the ongoing work to make sure that you know, we're, we're closing out uh, and finishing things that uh, you know, can be done in the next couple months. Uh, and then the new administration will be looking to you know, what their priorities are uh, moving ahead and where they want to focus efforts. So one, one 
reason for kind of bringing this to the various advisory committees uh, and specifically including the fees committee is to make sure that we maintain kind of the elevated uh, uh, priority for this uh, as we we transition. Uh, certainly it will be in our transition memos uh, that want to continue this work. And uh, I, I put the burden, you know, partly on, on Wayside Cleanup Advisory Committee, the Solid Waste Advisory, and the Fees Advisory folks to make sure that it continues to be an agenda item and a focus uh, as, as we transition uh, into the next administration. So I, I would think months would be um, uh, uh, optimistic, yes. Um, but if we make it through, you know, certainly as we make it through th these next couple of months between the moving and the transition, I think really January is going to you know, be the point where we uh, start making real progress in that. And then the, uh, and I think prioritizing it is what the part of the discussions that we're having internally, uh, obviously on one end would be the regulatory changes, but there are, there are some things uh, that can have more immediate, more effective, um, more immediate effect, um, like adju potential adjustments to the COM 15 requirements is one example. And again, not a recommendation, just recognizing that that would be an easier one to do. Thank you. Cool. All right, thank you. Again, uh, to, to Ned's point, I applaud the department and the uh, Soils Coalition for taking this effort on. It's uh, greatly needed. Um, I, I just have a, a question uh, looking for some comment, uh, working on a particular project that um, it's located in an RCS1 location. Uh, we've generated some material that um, is remediation waste slightly above RCS1 and um, the, the, the project contractor is proposing reuse at a facility, which is an RCS2. I won't comment on the facility, but that facility does have an administrative consent order and a corrective action design in place. And we're, we're told that they can accept remediation waste and to me, it doesn't just feel right. Um, because once it leaves our site, it's considered to be remediation waste, although it may meet the RCS2 criteria at the receiving site. I just wonder if there's some comment on that. Uh, th yes, th this had this little you know quirk has been identified. I, I was thinking of including my 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 um, complicated soil management flowchart in this, uh, and then there's one little box in there which. Uh, we identified years ago as being a quirk. And we, uh, after the listening sessions last year, this was identified as one of the, the items that we could uh, address. And the regional staff uh, have been working with the individual uh, facilities. And if the facility would like to uh, accept not all remediation waste, but this specific type of remediation waste, which is less... Uh, it would have to be an RCS2 facility that's approved to take less than RCS2 material. And uh, whether or not it's remediation waste does not depend upon the concentration. Uh, it's all less than RCS2, but it depends upon the nature of the location where it's excavated, its point of origin. And if the only reason that it's remediation waste is because it's uh, being dug up at an RCS1 location rather than an RCS2 location, then those ACOs have uh, either have been modified or in the process of being modified. I'm not sure of the exact status, uh, but it's been several months now uh, to allow those facilities to take remediation waste that is less than RCS2. So I, I would Firstly, I would check. You know, the the ACOs should be online uh, or the um, the approved uh, acceptance criteria. Uh, the soil management plan would be online. I would check to make sure that you know it has been appropriately uh, uh, revised uh, for that. But there are facilities that uh, that should be allowed should be taking it now. And so, Paul, just to. Um... Uh, clarify that if the ACO for a particular facility does not yet specify 
right. uh, the case that they here, can yeah. take remediation waste, uh, which I think is the case in your situation, right, Cole? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, then should we be waiting to, you know, move that material until we see that updated ACO? I. Good question. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> Uh, the facility cannot unilaterally decide that they are going to take it. They do have to right. go to the region and have the ACO and or their uh, soil management plan. It, it may, the actual language may, ex I'm not sure exactly where it exists. The ACO references the soil management plans, um, but that has to be revised before the facility should be taking the soil. Thank you. That's helpful. Laurie. Hi, um, I was just wondering, I'm sure other states have similar issues and um, if you've sort of looked at maybe some solutions that other um, states have looked at for a similar problem. Uh, other states have similar issues, yes. Um, I don't, I, many of them don't deal with the volumes we have, uh, certainly the New England states. Uh, NUMO are the Northeast Waste Management Officials Association. Uh, and they're looking for a new executive director. Uh, their current executive director is retiring. So just to plug uh, uh, numoa.org. Um, but they they have a soil management group. Uh, so the New England states in New York and New Jersey uh, get together and talk soil. Uh, that's a fun time uh, periodically. And, and and I really didn't mean that sarcastically. It, it, it is fun. Um, and there are there are things other that other states are actually cities. I, I've always been intrigued. New York City has um, you know has a great system. It seems of managing uh, soil excavate. Um, I that you know I, I I don't know whether or how we could copy it, uh, but kind of having places where uh, material can come in and you know you can swap out you know, have borrow pits where people can bring stuff or or, or take stuff uh, certainly seems it would be great to have facilities like that. So it's not just permanently uh, uh, disposing of or reusing soil, um, but but it's more in flux where you, you have soil coming and going. Uh, and that would, I think, go a long way to uh, managing the uncertainty and the timing problems uh, in the short-term storage solutions. Um, I, I think that would be something that if that would be interesting to consider how something like that uh, you know, could or would be permitted if there was a, um, a proponent to come along uh, looking for something like that. And then other than that, you know, a lot of states seem to just try shipping it to, to an adjacent state. Yeah, we and a lot of a lot of New England states point their fingers at us. Uh, okay, well, any other questions? Are uh, the department you know, is going to you know, keep this as being a, a high priority? Um, and I'm sure we look forward. We'll look forward to to working with you, Matthew. Yes. yes. I know, uh, but I just had to ask the question about the bugbear in the room of PFAS, which is increasingly becoming an obstacle to soil disposal. I know, now I'm making Paul uh, no. shake his head and cover his face, but, um, you know, how, how, how is that, that would certainly maybe affect the timing of all these things you're trying to do, trying to deal with the PFAS issue. But also the community acceptance. I mean, it just it has bearing all along. Not to mention the background issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean that that's that's out there. Um, I think one one thing that certainly becomes important is the the need for like RCS two facilities. Um, the the difference between the the PFAR, PFAS RCS one and the RCS two values. Uh, are huge and will continue to be significant even after, uh, you know, if and when the new toxicity values are finalized, and if and when the new the EPA produces an MCL. There's a lot in flux there, but I, I think it 
it emphasizes the benefits of reusing these materials in locations that do not overlie a GW1 area. So to the extent that you, know, you can identify locations that are in GW2 or GW3, um, you know, I, I think that's, that's where I would focus my efforts in, in identifying locations for these facilities. Um, because that, the, I mean, the, one of the kind of talking points for a lot of you know, these proposals is that, well, we can, we can limit the type of soil, you know, the soils that really are problematic for a lot of the redevelopment projects are not ones that pose a huge risk for leaching. Uh, you know, it's more urban fillish, you know, pHs, metals, um, you know, not the VOC contaminated soil that, that you might be concerned about for leaching. So, uh, a lot of thought is you can have kind of fewer controls and perhaps not leachate collection systems and bottom liners and things like that um, for these soil facilities because they don't pose the same risk if you carefully control what soil goes into it. Um, PFAS kind of uh, throws a, uh, a small monkey wrench into that uh, as we consider how, uh, you know, how that needs to be factored in. Uh, Ned, one more time. Yeah, just one, one uh, question. And perhaps the folks who are actually working on this, unlike me, have already considered this. But just while we're throwing out ideas, perhaps a longer term idea to consider is whether in terms of finding locations where this material can be um, disposed of or reused, is there any excess state land that might be helpful uh, in that regard. And again, I recognize that's probably more complicated than the other issues we've talked about, perhaps with the exception of PFAS. But since it wasn't mentioned, I just wanted to throw it out in case it's helpful to put it on the list. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's you know, potentially on the list. I, I think we'd have to get somebody like DCAM <laughs> involved in this. And, and we have friends at DCAM. So, um, and, and they also face the same problem as, you know, in their role as developers, uh, so uh, so that's something certainly to keep keep in mind. Okay, I I have to actually go to a ten o'clock meeting, so it, it has been nice talking with you all. Uh, thank you for your continued participation. This is you know, like one of the mo more interesting things. Uh, always has been. Thanks Bye, everybody. Thank you all for that, um, for all those questions too and, and discussion. And as Paul said, um, this is something we're gonna continue to be working on and, and focusing on um, in our upcoming advisory committee meetings. And, and I know this group will um, keep it on the agenda. And so we, we the DEP participants to date, um, have um, been considering the proposals the coalition put together and, and we have been doing more thinking on them. So we do hope to move forward with that. Um, so next, I think I'll go back to uh, sharing my screen. Hope this is the right one. And uh, bring up um, 